Dana Andrews and Nancy Kelly in Commencement in Khaki on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. But first, here is Gain Whitman. There's an old adage about how a stitch in time will save nine. That's particularly true with regard to clothing. The proper care of your clothes will save you a lot of expense, and frequent dry cleaning will make them look better and last longer. DuPont cleaning fluids, per-clean and tri-clean, are specially developed for dry cleaning in scientifically designed cleaning units. They are thorough, safe, and leave no odor. When your clothes are cleaned with DuPont fluids, no oily film remains to catch dust and dirt. They come back to you bright and clean, looking their best. If you choose a dry cleaner who uses DuPont fluids, you'll benefit from their speed, safety, and efficiency. These fluids are among DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. The DuPont Company presents Commencement in Khaki, starring Dana Andrews as Corporal Pete Johnson and Nancy Kelly as Sergeant Alice Romney on The Cavalcade of America. The scene of our story is Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, where the Army set up the first camp college. In one of the barracks, we find Corporal Pete Johnson sitting on his bunk as his friend, Sime Kramer, comes in. Hello, Pete, old Pete. Well, if it is my old friend, Sime Kramer, how are you? Huh? Hey, you just seen me an hour ago. I know. When did you disappear after chow? I thought we were going into New York. Uh, Pete, uh, you was a previous professor at the University of Wisconsin. Oh, an instructor, Sime. I told you that. I was still working for my Ph.D. when I was drafted. Okay. But you were still a teacher, right? What about it? Well, because you was one, I figured you might know all the uh, lowdown about this here Kilmer College. Well, it's not a bad idea, only I don't think it'll work out. Give me a reason. Look, how do we get on this subject? We'll miss the bus. Give me a for instance, baby. Well, I'll ask you. Can you see a lot of G.I.s taking a sudden interest in Shakespeare, Freud, calculus? Well, they got the professors from Rutgers University lined up to take over. It's the G.I.s I'm talking about. Think they'd give up nights to attend college when they could be in New York? Corporal Pete Johnson... You are looking at one who has made the sacrifice. What are you talking about? All out of your head, baby. I am now a college boy. You? Mm-hmm. Signed up <laughs> ten minutes ago. I'm taking public speaking. <laughs> oh, no. What's so comical that you should go into hysterics? <laughs> time, time. Don't do this. Don't corrupt this beautiful Bronx English of yours. You'll ruin it. You'll spoil your accent. Yeah, now, look, Pete. I figured that if we was to stay pals, I'd better stop embarrassing you by saying they ain't when you're saying they wasn't. <laughs> oh, Syme, who is the poor, unfortunate instructor of the public speaking class? Ah, now we're getting around to the crush of the matter. Pete, you was a professor in Wisconsin. You talk English. Good, very good. So... Wait a minute, wait a minute. Syme, did you, by some underhanded trick, suggest my name for that job? Baby, you got wonderful ignition. Intuition. Uh... <laughs> Well, you got it. Now, just a minute. You and I have been pals for a long time. We've gone through a lot together, haven't we? Oh, the whole thing, the whole thing. Africa, Sicily, Anzio. Do you want to stay pals? Well, sure. Sure, why not? I'll tell you why not. Because I want nothing to do with Camp Kilmer College or any other college. I'm through with classrooms and students. I'm finished with them, washed up. Get it? You mean you don't want to be a professor no more? That's it. But why not? Because, sign. I've been around too much in the past three years to let myself be locked up in a classroom again. I couldn't stand it. Yeah, but Pete, baby, look, I got I get it. I'm going to New York. Ah, Pete, baby, wait a minute. Jane ain't at all. I don't go for it. Now, look, Pete, you could kind of just run up and see Captain Waters now for a couple of minutes. I, I, well, I kind of promise him you might. How about it, baby? Get away from me. I smell a rat. You're too enthusiastic about this. You're too anxious to get me to see Captain Waters. Why? Pete, there ain't nothing at all. Hey, wait a minute. Wasn't there a three-day pass offered for every suggestion accepted? Pete, are you standing there suggesting that I put up your name to get a crummy three-day pass? You'd put up your own grandmother on the auction block if there was any advantage in it for you. You're hurting my feelings. I'd gladly hurt your head if such a thing were possible. 
You did do it, didn't you? Now, baby, it just come to me like, you know, that, that I you could get a three-day pass by throwing me to the wolves. Sign, someday I'm going to kill you. I'm going to cut your throat with a dull knife so it'll take a long oh, time. Oh, dear, dear, how bloodthirsty. Huh? Good evening, Corporal Johnson. I see your temper hasn't improved any. Right. What's the matter with you? Well, nothing. Nothing at all, Peter. All the trouble seems to be coming from you. Now, look here. I don't know who you are. Oh, you don't. You don't. Oh, your memory is as short as your temper, isn't it? Yeah, he's always like this, Sarge. Mm, I see. Well, you try pouring water over his hot little head. It's been so nice seeing you again, Peter. Ha, ha. Uh, who the devil was that? A whack. I can see that, you idiot. But who is she? I don't know, baby, but if I ever saw a dish like that, I'd have a better memory than you got. Now, never mind her. What about you and that pass? Okay, okay, I'll own up to it. But I did think it was a good idea even without the pass. Oh, shut up. look, please, Pete, please, for a pal, just go see Captain Waters, huh? This ain't gonna hurt. All right. <laughs> All right, Sime, ah. I'll see him. You'll get your pass, and I can still refuse Add to do up, it. baby, Add up, baby. Right this way, Professor, the captain awaits your presence. <laughs> You're a real pal, Pete, doing this for me. Why don't you just shut up and let me sweat this oh, out? Oh, Peter, no. Still in a temper. Hey, are you in all places? It's that wax sergeant again, Pete. I can see. Look, Sergeant, I'm afraid you have me at a disadvantage. Oh, <laughs> well, that evens things up a little. The last time we met, I was at a disadvantage. You ain't never told me about this, Keep Pete. out of this, Sime. Yes, Sime, you keep out of it. This is between Corporal Johnson and me, just like our last argument. I don't think I've ever had an argument with you, Sergeant. Um... May I uh, sit down? Oh, certainly, certainly. Now, what is all this, Sergeant? <laughs> oh, well, this is embarrassing, Peter. I wonder what your folks in Racine and your friends at Wisconsin U would think of your memory. But I... And your pal, Sime here, for example. Yeah, me too. I told you to keep out of this. Now, look, Sergeant... No, Alice. Alice Romney. Well, does that name mean anything to you? My memory is perfect, especially for faces. If I had seen you anywhere, just for a flicker of an eyelash, I could never have forgotten you. Oh, what a lovely speech. Do you use it on all the girls you like to forget? Now, look, I... I've been given the brush off before, Peter, but never quite like this. It's, it's novel and uh, quite ingenious. Hey, she uses words like you, Pete. She must know you. She does not. I never met her before in my life. I don't even recognize her name. It's very rude to speak of me in the third person, Peter. If I were really rude, I should say that speaking of you in the past tense would delight me at the moment. You are in a temper. Is he always like this, son? Nah, he's only like this when he's mad something. Well, it must be terribly trying on his friend's nerves. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to leave you two alone so you can discuss my temper, shortcomings, or anything else you want to discuss. Hey, hey keep it down, baby. The captain's office is right here. So what? You're all nuts. Jason? Who is that yelling? I was yelling, sir. Well, take it outside. This is a college building. Yes, sir. Right away. Hey, no, no, Captain. This is him. This is Corporal Johnson, the speech professor. Oh, oh. Well, uh, come in, Corporal. Come into my office. Yes, sir. I'll see you later, Sime. You too, Sergeant Romney. Oh, how thrilling. Do you think you'll remember me? If you aren't... Uh, the... Come in, Corporal. Right away, sir. Uh, sit down, Corporal. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, Private Kramer suggested your name. He thought you might take over the class in public speaking at Kilmer College. Captain, I don't want to go back to teaching. No? Why not? All right, sir, I'll tell you why. I can't go back into a classroom because now it would seem a futile and useless thing. Pete, I'll tell you something. That's why we started Kilmer College. Because many men are in your state of mind. They're afraid to see themselves in a the classroom again. I see. Now, this college is an experiment. We figure if we can put some men back on this scholastic track and start others, we have accomplished our purpose. Now, uh, now what do you say, Pete? The answer is still no, Captain. The men won't be interested. All right. If 15 men register for a class in public speaking, will you take it over? Why, 15 is a fairly high number, Pete. Most of the men want languages, accounting, business administration, English. All right. If 15 men register for the class, I'll teach it. Good. Thanks, Corporal, for your time. Thank you, sir. Pete, Pete, did you take it? Are you going to be my school teacher? No. I turned it down and... 
You still here? Oh, you remembered me. How wonderful. I'm going to the barracks and dream about this wonderful moment. Why don't you stop this idiotic run around and tell me what this is all about? Some other time, Peter. I've got to see Captain Waters immediately. I'm bringing him the list of men and women enrolled in the public speaking class. Um, I enrolled them myself. What? How many are on that list? Mm, let's see. Um, Fourteen. Fourteen? Oh, fifteen, really. There's one more. Me. <laughs> I'm Corporal Pete Johnson. I'm supposed to teach you public speaking. Not because I particularly want to. So before we go on, there are a few things I'd like to say. Look, McGuire, there's no need to be scared. Yeah, but my knees shake when I get up in front of people. Then put your foot on a chair and lean on your knee. Try that. First, my folks lived in, uh, then they moved to Michigan, and they, uh, I was drafted in night. I wanted to be a paratrooper. There was a guy. No, 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 Sergeant Bo- Bohawk. I've told you a dozen times to think of what you're going to say before you get up. Get right to the point. For our next class, I want each of you to bring in a prepared speech. Uh, would you suggest the subject, Professor? Yes, I'm. I can for you. You bring in a speech on how to sell a pal down the river. Really, Peter, I enjoy your classes. And you really aren't a bad instructor. Why, thank you, Sergeant Romney. Why don't you just call me Alice? I called you Peter, you know. I do know. But then you claim a past friendship. Let's sit down here. It's such a lovely night. Okay. What are you thinking about, Peter? Oh, I'm just wondering if any of those guys are getting anything out of the class. Out of anything here at Kilmer College. You don't think so, do you? Frankly, I don't see how they can. Well, Peter, you're too intelligent to be bitter. Oh, it's not bitterness, Alice. I'd say it was more like a gentle cynicism. And cynicism isn't worthy of you either. Then it isn't that either. Look, Pete. It's going to be an awfully small world. Smaller than it's ever been before. And people are going to be closer together. So? What's your point? Well, my point is that you, I, Simon, little Tommy McGuire, Sergeant Bohawk, all of us, we've had our perspectives changed. War, perhaps. Maybe we've developed a protective cynicism. But it's cramping us. And we have to do something to break out, to, to see the world again in relation to other people. Strangers. Kilmer College will help us do that. By giving a class in public speaking? Oh, no, Pete. By giving a class in human relationship. Each class will do that. You have something to offer. You think so? Oh, I know so. You want to know something else? What, Peter? You're a rather pretty girl in a splendiferous sort of way. We weren't talking about that, Corporal. I know. I changed the subject. Alice, um... How about going into New York tomorrow night? Maybe a show. Oh, I'd love it, Peter. Swell. I'll tell you what, we'll miss Camp Chow. I know a place on 48th Street. Oh, no, 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 Peter, I can't. Not dinner together. Why not? But that would mean conversation, Peter, and you know how I bore you. You? Bore me? What are you talking about? Who said you bored me? (laughs) Well, uh, you did tell me once that I was the dumbest creature who ever lived. Don't you remember? There you go again. Just when I thought you were over that nonsense, you start in again. Temper, Peter. Temper, temper. I'm not losing my temper. Alice, please. You do like me, don't you? Well, if I hadn't liked you, Peter, I'd, I'd never have taken the trouble to find out all about you. All right, we'll call it quits for tonight. But I swear that I'll make you talk tomorrow night at dinner. <laughs> you may be a good instructor, Peter, but you certainly don't know women. What do you mean now? Uh... Well, don't you know, Pete, that the surest way to keep a woman quiet is to try to make her talk? You're listening to Dana Andrews as Corporal Pete Johnson and Nancy Kelly as Sergeant Alice Romney in Commencement in Khaki. On the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company. Maker of better things for better living through chemistry.
Corporal Peter Johnson has taken over a class in public speaking at Kilmer College. But that's not his big problem. As the second part of our story opens, we find Pete and Syme in the barracks. As Syme says... All right, come on now, baby, come on. If you can't get to sleep, tell Papa what's eating you. It's Alice, Syme. She's driving me crazy. Yeah? How, baby? You've never been in love, have you, Syme? Love? Oh, sure, plenty of times. Why, why, I was the Casablanca of the Bronx. Casanova, Syme. Well, I was good. But Alice, she knows all about me. She won't tell me how. She swears I called her a dumb little scarecrow. Ain't that a dirty shame? Oh, Syme. The only dirty shame is that you're still saying dirty after six weeks in my yeah. class. Yeah. Murder, ain't it? <laughs> Shut up. Now, look, baby, don't go getting hot at me, because I ain't kneeling you, am I? It's that dame. I'm in love with her, Syme. Is the feeling parry mutual? <laughs> I don't know. Well, what's the matter? Ain't you taller? Every time I get around to it, she... She brings up that mysterious quarrel we had. Yeah. Well, I could see how that would chill things a little. Yeah, it's like a shower of cold water. Telling you, Sam, something's got to be done. Say, sure. you got it right over the head, ain't you? All right, all right. Let's forget it now. Yeah, sure, sure, baby. I know all about dames, Pete. Now, look, you just got to sleep and forget about it. Leave it all to me. I've heard those words before, and they sound ominous. I'm going to fix it for you. Sure, sure, sure. I'll go to sleep. Ah, dames. They got hearts like statues. I'm going to fix it for Pete. I sure am. Hey, Sergeant Mummy. Hey, Sergeant. What? Oh, good evening, Syme. Why aren't you with Pete? Well, I, I was just going to class. Which class, Syme? Oh, the same as you are. Uh, you're taking art appreciation? And why not? I can't appreciate it no more than nobody else. Oh, well, I, I, I just meant that you're taking so many classes. All they got, Sarge, all they got. Because, like the captain says, never have so many needed to know so much. Uh, have you seen much of uh, Pete lately? Mm, yes, quite a bit. Why, son? Well, uh, he's a swell guy, huh? Oh, he's very nice. Yeah. Now, look, suppose there was somebody who was making a monkey out of him. Who, who's doing that, uh, son? Oh, nobody, nobody. I was just saying, uh, supposing there is. Uh, Pete, uh, he's a great guy. Him and me as pals. Yes, yes, I know you are. He talks about you a great deal. Yeah. And now, if there was somebody making a monkey out of him, uh, what would you do? Well, I'd, uh, I'd say that if he had it coming to him, it'd be a very good thing. Mm-hmm. Even if, uh, well, if Pete was kind of soft for the day... I, I, I mean, the one that's been doing the needling? Sign is... Is Pete fond of the person who's making a monkey out of him? Oh, up to his ears. Up to his ears. Does he... Does he talk much about this person? All the time, Sarge. All the time. I... Oh, Sam, you're a very nice person, too. Uh, huh? You're wonderful, Sam. You're the most gorgeous, the most precious person in the world. Hey, hey, Good now, night, now, Sam. Now, 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 I'll see you tomorrow. Oh, uh, uh, well, how do you like that? Making a monkey out of Pete and then making a play for me. His best pal. Okay, baby. I'll fix your clock. Oh, uh, Corporal Johnson. Oh, good evening, Captain Waters. Thought I'd sit in on the class tonight, Pete. Anything special, sir? Graduation exercises are next week, and I'm looking for a speaker, Pete. Do you have any likely material? They've all done well, Captain. And you? How about you? <laughs> well, I've changed my mind, sir. I've written to Wisconsin and told them I'd like to get back into the teaching job again. I'll go after my Ph.D. and a full professorship. Good. Gilmer College has accomplished things, hasn't it? Yes, sir. Oh, good evening, Alice. Uh, Sergeant Romney. Good evening, Corporal. Captain Waters. Good evening, Sergeant. Hmm. I see what you mean. <laughs> well, uh, suppose we get on with it, Corporal. Can you find a good speaker for me? Well, suppose you be the judge, sir. Excuse me. At ease. This is, as you know, is our last class. Captain Waters has something to say. Uh, Captain? Uh, thank you, Corporal. I'd like to ask a question of the class. Has Kilmer College justified your time and effort? Uh, Tommy McGuire, would you like to answer that? Well, yes, I would. I don't have to think much about it, Captain. I wanted to be a lawyer, but I was worried. I didn't know if books and study would, well, would make sense anymore. They do, sir. 
I'm definitely going to study law now, sir. Oh, good for you, Tommy. Well, Captain, Sergeant Bullhock used to have trouble speaking. And now, Sergeant? Well, sir, ten weeks ago it would have taken me 15 minutes to get into the first sentence. Now I can get to the point without telling the life history of a dog I had back in Pennsylvania. That's all, sir. <laughs> Very good, Sergeant. Uh, now, Sergeant Romney, what would you say you got out of Kilmer College? Well, I'm not going to tell you everything I got out of it, sir. <laughs> You, uh, you blush beautifully, Sergeant. I, I want to say this about Kirk's College, and it's the same thing I would say about the whole army. Briefly, this is the first war in our history in which women have taken a full and tremendous share. But the men in uniform had their doubts as to how we would p- perform in military jobs. I speak from personal experience. I can still remember the first soldier whom I relieved for combat duty. He nearly snapped my head off, and only because I was a woman. But I think now that even he would be among the first to admit that we wax proved ourselves. Well, now the war is over and won, and we have our way of life, and we're now going home. But I'm putting every man on notice. Don't forget the women. Don't forget we stood by you. And let's have a little more of your brotherliness so that we can have a little more brotherhood throughout the world. You were terrific, Alice. But when you spoke back there in the class, you seemed to be talking right at me. Oh? Did I? You were looking at me. Every word was aimed at me. Well, most of them were, Pete. Why? Because when I met you, I thought you were the most colossal egotist I'd ever run into. Your male chauvinism was pretty hard to take. I? Chauvinism? But look, Alice, never in my whole life have I... I... Oh, no, you're wrong. I wouldn't act that way toward you. Of all people. No, but you did, Pete. And it hurt. I found out all about you, and I swore to myself that if ever I could get back at you, I would. Oh, Alice, for heaven's sake. When? How? Where? You remember Naples, 1943? Naples? Sure. What about it? We wax had just disembarked, and we were told that one of us was needed to relieve a soldier for combat right away. His outfit was moving up the line. Well, one of the girls hopped a jeep and went out to the area. Then what? When she got there, only headquarters company was left, and there was one truck waiting for one soldier who had to stay there until relieved by a whack. Alice, I was that soldier? Yes, you were, Pete. And what did you do? You tell me. I will. You tried to show that girl your entire job in one minute. It wasn't a hard No, it wasn't. But that girl was scared, Pete. She was so scared because it was her first hour overseas, and there you were, scowling and furious, because this girl seemed stupid. The truck was waiting for me. I had to hurry. Yes, I know, but you told that girl she was a dumb little scarecrow. You said all wax were dumb. But, Alice... And you ran off. You left her with the files and the battalion list and everything. You remember that dumb little scarecrow, Pete? It couldn't have been you. Well, it was. But that that girl mumbled when she tried to talk. Her face was all out of shape. Well, I mumbled because my jaw was swollen. I had a terrific toothache and I was half crazy with pain. Oh. But you couldn't see that, could you, Pete? All you thought was there was a stupid girl and... Honey, honey, listen to my side, will you? Do you have an excuse, Peter? Well, if you were half crazy with pain, I was half crazy from the thought that my outfit would go on without me. I'd been stuck in an office job because the doc put me there. When the chance came for me to get out, I had to take it. I see. Alice, can you forget what I said that day? Is there any reason that I should? Yes. I love you. Is that a good reason? Well, it's... Let's not talk so much. That's much better, Peter. Uh (laughs) Aha! There you are. Have a look up here. Well, baby thinks it's all fixed. And this chick ain't going to get in your hand no more. Pete, what's he talking about? I don't know. Sign, what did you do? This dame has been driving you crazy like you said. Why, she was coming between us even. So I talked with the major. And you, Sergeant Romney, you are finished with toying with my pal. Tomorrow, you're being transferred to California. (gasps) California? Alice, California. Oh, oh. Oh, no. Sign, how could you? Pete. What are you doing with that chair? Oh, Pete, Pete, darling, D- don't hit him. Hey, Why? Pete, get off me. It's murder. No, sign, baby, not murder. It's murder. And in a torn degree. Nancy Kelly will return to our cavalcade microphone in a moment. 
Now here is Gain Whitman. Low, wide buildings, hundreds of yards long with tremendous doors, were speedily built by American engineers to increase production. These were the vast factories in which America built the tens upon tens of thousands of planes demanded by war in the air. Down the production lines inched the slow-moving fuselages, fed every few yards by tributary streams of sub-assemblies. Off they stretched into the distance as far as the eye could see. And as far as the ear could hear, there was a roar of pneumatic riveting hammers. But there were tight cramped places in the tail, in the wings, where air hammers couldn't reach and patent fasteners had to be used. One day, astonished riveters heard a new sound. Riveting? Yes, it was riveting all right, but the sound was different. It was the ping-ping of explosive rivets. Where there wasn't room enough, where a man could work only from one side, the new rivets were simply placed in the holes. A small explosive charge in the shank of the rivet was fired by a heated riveting iron. The shank expanded... The rivet was tightly, smoothly set. Explosive rivets, invented abroad and perfected in the United States by the DuPont Company, were the answer to a long-felt need in the aircraft industry. Now they offer the answer to many peacetime production problems. Metal furniture, assemblies in buses that are hard to reach. There are dozens of uses now. And nobody can even guess how many there will be in the future. For these handy little fasteners that button metal or plastic parts together as fast as you can drop them into holes and touch them with a heated riveting iron will help speed up the production of radios, vacuum cleaners, and other appliances. Explosive rivets are among the newest of the DuPont Company's better things for better living through chemistry. Say, Gain, may I say something? Sure, Dana, what is it? That bit of information about explosive rivets was very interesting. In fact, I always listen to what you have to say after the cavalcade play. It's very informative. Well, thank you. That was very nice of him, wasn't it, Nancy? Mm-hmm. A pretty speech like that could only come from a professor in public speaking. Oh, no, I'm serious. Well, you'll want to listen next week, then, when I talk about the treasure chest. Oh, and I have another reason for wanting to listen next week, Gain. I understand um, John Hodiak will be on. That's for me. We'll also have Janet Blair with us, Nancy. Mm-hmm. That's for me. What's the story, Gain? It's the story of Billy Bryant, the George M. Cohan of the Mississippi River, and his life on the showboat. It's called The Children of Old Man River. When, by the way, this will be presented in New York as a full-hour television show on January 30th, with music, dancing, gorgeous girls, a beautiful showboat set, and all the trimmings. This will not only be a preview of our next week's Cavalcade of America but a preview of things to come in entertainment. We'll be at our radios next Monday at Cavalcade time, Gain, to hear Children of Old Man River, won't we, Nancy? We certainly will. Okay, and thanks, Nancy Kelly and Dana Andrews, for being with us tonight. Dana Andrews appeared through the courtesy of Samuel Goldwyn and will soon star in the Golden production, Glory for Me. Nancy Kelly is soon to be seen in the Paramount picture, Follow That Woman. The music of tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was composed and conducted by Robert Armbruster. In the cast of Mr. Andrews and Miss Kelly were Eddie Marr as Syme and Gail Gordon as Captain Waters. Our Cavalcade play was written by Harry Granick. This is Tom Collins inviting you to listen next week to John Hodiak and Janet Blair in Children of Old Man River on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.